that worked for me last time. Okay, hi. Who are you? What do you teach and where do you teach? Yeah, Joe, my name is uh, Matt Stillwell. Uh, I teach at Front Range Community College and I teach composition. I teach literature. Sometimes I teach world mythology. And I've also taught extensively in learning communities that pair composition courses with psychology, history, and literature. And I've implemented learning contracts in all of those uh, modalities. Okay, you said learning contracts. So how is that grading scheme different than the traditional models of grading that we're all used to? Yeah, so a learning contract doesn't rely on on any numbers or any specific letter grades. Um, it's been a long evolution for me that what we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, but what it turns out in my research is like learning contracts were actually the tr traditional way of doing things prior to you know the turn of the 20th century and the 1920s when grades and the 100 point scale uh, became a tool to assess student learning for a mass education system. Um, but for me, um, learning contracts um, help us focus on the learning and help us build rapport and intrinsic motivation rather than using a point value or a percentage as um, the feedback that students really pay attention to. So do students actually do the work? Because it sounds like they could get out of doing the work in that kind of situation. Yeah, and again, uh, the, uh, the challenge in this kind of environment is that you are actually working with the students rather than holding the point value over their heads. And it takes a while for them to adjust. But once they do, they focus on the work and the learning itself. You would think that students would bail on it. We, I still have a regular course schedule. I still have scaffolded all of the writing projects with um, weekly work. You still have to do the weekly work in order to meet the expectations of the contract where you want to be successful. But once students figure that out, um, some of them work more, right? One of the dark sides of grades is that students will only work up to the point value. If they get that 98%, they'll stop learning. They'll stop engaging, even if they're getting an A. With the learning contract, you remove that barrier. And I get students who, who will submit more than the required two drafts with actual substantive revision in my composition classes over and above that. And they may have been an A student coming into my class, or they may not have been but they enjoy the work much more in that environment because there isn't like a point value that they're trying to reach. They're, they're doing it for themselves. Uh, at CSU, we use a, a learning management system called Canvas. I don't know what you use at Front Range. I think it's still Desire to Learn, but uh, yes, how, how does that factor into the way, into your learning contract? Yeah, it, it factors in a bunch of ways. I think this might be uh, another question that's that's coming up, but I'm going to go ahead and say it right now. Uh, my grade book in in Desire to Learn is a narrative grade book. So uh, the the categories up for assessment that I have set up are needs improvement, on contract, and exceeds contract. And so that's what my grade book looks like. I've set it up to be text. If a student is meeting the contract, at an on-contract level, that's a B level. I communicate that. That's the only letter grade I talk about all semester long. That's the only letter grade that's in my learning contract. If you are meeting the contract, you are actually uh, uh, above average. You're you're doing um, the work at a at a B level. Now, if you're not following the contract or you're missing things here and there, that would be at a needs improvement level. And then if you're doing more work, you're exceeding the contract. How does a student avoid being surprised at the end of the semester? How do, how do they know where they currently are at any point? Yeah, so um, three times every semester, um, I have students write their own self-assessments of learning. And that's where we have 
an individual conversation because the students could be excelling in different areas of the contract. I want students to be able to be rewarded for the actual learning that they're doing, not a cumulative score on everything. And so that allows us to have an individualized conversation. If a student is exceeding the contract in the process work, and they're on contract for the writing projects that are the summative assessments, they can overall be exceeding the contract because they're doing all the weekly work. That also goes back to the question you asked about do students do the work? That's how we show that the work matters because everything matters. It's not just a 200 point assignment when you've been nickel and dimed with 10 points here and there for brainstorming or process work. No, they're all equal, right? Um, and so um, that's how um, I manage that. Awesome. Uh, so um, how has your non-traditional grading approach evolved over time, Matt? Yeah, so I started, uh, I don't know, probably six or seven years ago. And I, I think I've, I've fully implemented learning contracts for at least a full five years now. And um, it began with an article that I think many people in the composition and rhetoric uh, discipline are familiar with. Uh, Jane Danielitz and Peter Elbow wrote an article about 2009, I think it's a white paper on unilateral grading contracts to improve teaching and learning. And I started there. Um, and then I've come across the Sao Inue and labor-based grading contracts. And so uh, as as we were talking, even before this began, you mentioned the fact that this is a continuous paradigm shift. This is this is not something that you do once and you're done. It's a continual negotiation with your students, with your own. I'll, I'm going to call it andragogy, um, uh, adult learning, right? The way that learning actually happens, and and so it's not a panacea. I can't stress that enough. Um, but it does allow us to see some of the shortcomings and blind spots of what we today consider traditional assessment practices through the 100 point scale, the A through F system, you know, the 100 uh, percentage point system. Um, we can see some of those blind spots. And once you see it, at least in my mind, you can't really you can't really go back. I interviewed. My friend Sarah Fay recently who uses grading contracts at UC Santa Barbara, and she said it's the one of the – using contracts or using non-traditional grading is one of the best professional development exercises you can do because it makes you rethink peer review, active learning, scaffolding, everything. Have you have you found that? I Yeah. I, I mean I couldn't agree with her anymore um, because it's not about – the specific strategies that you're using once you've made it's about the paradigm shift it's about seeing the inequities of a mass system of education that uses points percentages and letter grades as reporting functions not as learning functions <laughs> right it used to be prior to the 20th century that most assessment systems were idi idiosyncratic and only between the teacher and the student. It wasn't even between the teacher and the parents. It wasn't between the teacher and the institution. It wasn't um, between the teacher and the business community, right? And learning contracts gets that back to that relationship between just the teacher and the student. Yes, at the end of the semester, I have to enter a grade that goes on the student's transcript. I'm not that free, right? I haven't um, um, broken down the system that far, but how we get to that grade is idiosyncratic. It's individual to each student without creating the pressure on me as an instructor to provide necessarily individual instruction, but I can. The contracts give you leeway to focus in the areas where specific students need to improve or want to improve, right? Rather than just coming to that cumulative score at the end of the semester, which is not objective. Like the system's not objective. So you might as well just lean into the subjectivity of assessment in both K through 12 and higher education because 
like the system is built on that. And when you realize, when you look at what the output it is, like every system's designed for the outcomes it gets, if you're familiar with systems theory. So if you look at the outcomes we're getting, we should be looking at the system. And if we're not willing to change some of the elements of the system, and in this case, it's assessment, then we're going to just keep getting the same outcomes. One thing I want to get across to my CSU colleagues is that uh, this, if you're going to do this, uh, you have to be willing to change it over time and be creative and be flexible. It's not something you implement once and then and stick that way uh, and just stick with it. Um, how, how important do you think uh, the willingness to change and be and be creative is with uh, implementing a learning contract? Yeah, it's super important and it's super humbling uh, because, um, you know, every semester, every classroom dynamic is different. Um, and it's a dark mirror to look into <laughs> when you begin this process. And I agree with you, Joe, you can do it in stages. You don't have to do it all at once. And I'm also not arguing that grades don't have a place, right? I'm also not arguing that like this is, as you've said, it's not a one and done situation, but it's a very Zen place to be where as you begin implementing learning contracts or non or ungrading your uh, curriculum and your classroom, like you're going to have moments every semester, <laughs> moments of doubt, right? Um, but where I where I have arrived is that this mode of assessment allows me to align my beliefs about the way that people learn with my practice. I felt like a, part of the reason I made this change was because I felt like a hypocrite for so many years grading writing on point values. When if you know anything about how writers write and how they receive feedback and how they create great, write, great writing, they never get any points. But what they do get is feedback and practice and iteration, right? And I felt like a hypocrite telling students, well, hey, you know, this is really good, but it's a C, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm like, and writing's not based on points, but here's your 78, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I yep. just couldn't live the cognitive dissonance. Yes, it's strong. Got too much for me after a point and it didn't feel and I, this is an overused term anymore, but it didn't, but it's true. It didn't feel authentic to me. I felt like I was selling something student to students that um, I was, I was writing checks I couldn't cash mm -hmm. um, to students. And that's when I finally made the change to ungrade my, my classrooms. Well, I want to, I want to thank you for introducing me to this probably, oh gosh, 13 years ago. Um, you told me about it. Uh, when I worked with you at Front Range, and um, I thought that sounds great, but I'm not ready to do that, and I didn't pull the trigger on it until 10 years later, and um, so so thank you for that. Uh, when I did start doing it, I read a Sao Inouye's book, and I implemented his f uh, format whole cloth, and it was overwhelming for me, and so I want to I want to help others avoid <clears throat> going through the pain I went through. And um, I think baby steps or small steps might be a better way to to get into this. So, what advice do you have for somebody who's listening to everything you're saying and 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 saying preach, preach, brother? But then they don't know how to do it, or they they're they're uh, kind of uh, wary of of implementing it whole cloth. What what what's a a first step they could take? Yeah. So, uh, and thank you um, uh, for uh, you know reminding me of of that history. Uh, my evolution was slow. Uh, you know, I, I didn't fully implement ungrading for a long time. I thought about it and I didn't have any models. The professional development around ungrading right now is pretty robust. Um, you're finding more and more teachers who are adopting it. And so I would go back to something in terms of advice that I said earlier. Number one, it's not a panacea. So it's not going to solve all the interpersonal conflict sometimes that we have with students, particularly with the writing process. It's hard. It's really hard to do because you have to really examine what it is that you feel about how people learn, right? And, and then square that with um, your actual practice, whether it's assessment, whether it's active learning, many of the other approaches that you mentioned, um, Joe. Um, and then 
one baby step that I've been sharing. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, I'm also the instructional coach uh, for the Larimer campus at Front Range Community College right now. And, and I've been doing some sessions on this. And one of the things that I've encouraged people to do in terms of those baby steps you mentioned, Joe, is look, one practice that you can implement is if you're still using points, you can still use the points. But one thing you might try on an uh, activity or an assignment here and there is withhold the points from the students until they've read your feedback. So when an assignment is submitted, if it's submitted electronically, even if it's not, give them the feedback and say, when we've had an opportunity, when I know you've actually looked at my feedback and looked at the areas I've suggested you improve in, then I will release your point values. And then through like successive approximations to use a, a classical conditioning model, eventually you just remove the points altogether. Mm -hmm. And then they're just looking at the, at the feedback and you've done that over maybe a course of a, a couple of semesters or one assignment, and then you move it into another assignment. And then you reveal what you're doing to the students. You, 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 like we always talk about making the curriculum transparent, right? And I don't know the extent to which that can ever totally be achieved, but this is one small window in how we can make the assessment process and the learning process transparent for students. Look, what do you even need the points for if you've already got my feedback and you're acting on my feedback? And so that helps us both as teachers and students demystify this whole process of learning and assessment. Okay, that's that's an excellent way to uh, to kind of dip your toe in the water and it's uh, pretty simple. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, anything else you'd like to share with us, Matt Stillwell? Well, you know, Joe, I could go on for days. So um, I, I I know you want to keep this um, short and, and to the point, but um, I, I would just reiterate something that we bounced off of a couple of times and your your uh, colleague, something she mentioned. Um, it's been it's it, it's a, a constant 15 week professional development opportunity that you do for yourself because you are uh, changing your paradigm, but that also means you're changing the paradigm for, for students. Ken Bain um, in his book, What the Best College Teachers Do, talks about the idea of expectation failure. What we want to do in a learning environment is we want to give students some expectation failure, desirable difficulty. And what I've found with learning contracts, it's not just what we're doing. It's not just the content and the curriculum that we're doing that helps students learn in this particular model. The learning contract, how we do it is a whole other way that students are, are learning. I could talk about growth mindset. I could talk about expectation failure. I could talk about all of those things, but watching students just wrap their minds around the learning contract and how we're approaching learning is as fun as watching them write um, and engage in the curriculum over the course of a semester. So I think it's a pretty worthwhile thing. <clears throat> I thought of another question, quality. Uh, is the What's the quality of the writing like? So I had the first semester I tried this, uh, a student called me over and I walked over to her and she said, wait, you're not grading me on the quality of my writing? And I said, no, but I will give you a lot of feedback, and then um, you're going to apply that feedback and uh, your peers' feedback into a new draft, and we'll work on it throughout the semester. And she said, so I could just turn in anything? And I said, well, it has to meet the requirements of the assignment. It has to be 1,500 words. has to have seven sources, blah, blah, blah. But I could just, like, that's all I have to do. And then I could just... I said, yeah, yeah, that's – you." Have... And then, and then she just kind of sat there and puzzled over that. And what she was doing was she was puzzling over how much work do I want to put in this? Um, do I want to learn from this? Why am I in college? And um, yeah, her paper turned out to be great. You know, um, how do how do you ensure that the writing quality is is great if you're not giving them a seventy two to let them know that you know the writing wasn't very good or a ninety eight to let them know it was awesome? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of things. So this goes back to when I started, you know, that uh, Dan Yellowitz and Elbow 
article and Peter Elbow in that article says, look, you can get a B in this class and it's not about the quality of your writing. It's only when in that unilateral contract, you get to the A level. That's when we start talking about the quality of writing. Now, we all know, I think, as, as composition and, and rhetoric professionals, that the more students write, the better their writing gets, <laughs> right? And so that's that's just been my own personal journey, right? I wanted students to write more. And the points and the grades are a disincentive to them writing because one of two things happens generally when students get feedback with a letter grade or a point attached to it. They look at it and they love it. It's a 98%. Sometimes they'll come back and say, what's the 2% for? And we can't explain it, <laughs> right? Which also sort of, you know, uh, is introspective of what grades really mean. What right. was the two points for? I don't know. I'll just give you a hundred. Can anybody be a hundred? Anyway, it's <laughs> that whole thing. Or yeah. they look at, at the feedback of, or the point value and they don't like it. And they don't, they never read your feedback. Look, the research has been done when we combine, even when we combine really good feedback with a grade, a traditional grade, students don't look at the feedback. And so the idea becomes, how can we remove that extrinsic motivator of the letter grade so that students will actually, think about how much time we spend on feedback to students that they never read because the default feedback in K through 12 and higher education is a point value, a letter or a percentage. And that's really all they're looking at. It's the rare student that actually reads our feedback and looks at the number and then either comes back and says, well, you just don't like my writing style, <laughs> right? Or, you know, what was the 2% for? Or the two points for? So um, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that the writing quality matters because to be honest, I've, I've been looking a lot at business writing and... Um, there are a lot of people who have really great jobs who aren't great writers, right? We, we like to, like, there's a difference, I think, between composition and communicated, communication. We want students to be good communicators, right? And writing plays a role in that. But for most jobs, particularly at the community college level that we're preparing students for, they're not going to be Anne Lamott or they're not going to be you know, Peter, El there, that's not what the goal is. The goal is to do the work. And the learning contract allows us to focus on the work because so many students have been damaged in so many English and composition classes. They had really great ideas, but because their students hated or their teachers hated semicolons or sentence fragments or run-ons, they never got the practice that they needed because the grade was the disincentive to do the practice. So I just, that was the problem I was trying to solve for myself and for my students when I implemented um, my version of, of learning contracts. I just want them to write more. It doesn't have to be about the quality, but they do it because they want to, not because I'm making them. Yeah, and um, and with that previous damage done to students, that's why it's really important to uh, explain to them often what you're doing with this learning contract. You can't just throw it out and say, it's different, read it, figure it out. You it, you have to bring it up in class all the time, see if there's any questions. Because they they might think it's a trick. Like, what's happening here? What's he doing? Is this real? Is it really gonna turn out this way? And so, um, yeah, we could do a whole nother video on undoing the damage done, <laughs> right? But yeah. but this is one, I found this is one little way to kind of address that. So, oh man, yeah, that's another whole point. Um, yeah, yeah. Matt, I really appreciate it. This was gold. This and uh and uh I don't know. Good luck. It sounds like well, obviously I already know you really care for your students and you're doing everything you can. And uh thank you for talking to us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing and I enjoy I always enjoy our our conversations. So, uh keep fighting the power and driving it like you stole it. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Matt. Yeah, take care. Okay, you too.